Akshuda Gopi, Devi Dasi Prabhu is giving class today. As always, every Kadeshi, she's very steady in her service. Good morning, Akshuda Gopi. Welcome to our assembly. Uh, hello, everybody. It's 7.17. I don't have the time to say hello to each and every one of you. Akshuda Gopi, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's go for it. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Just making sure we can all hear me, yeah? Perfect. So wonderful. Um, I, I really do think that the, the, the duet, the, we, we, we need the duets. We need Adi Purusha first. We, like, we need, this is, this is necessary. <laughs> I feel like it's the perfect, perfect, uh, perfect beginning. And just for us to really concentrate on our, our acharyas just a little bit before we talk about more acharyas. So of course, without further ado, we'll begin. Om Agyanatya Mirandasya Gyanjanakaya Chakshur Tasmaya Shri Nirvana Shri Chaitanya Novishtam Shtapitayana Bhutale Swayam Rupa Tadamayam Dadati Swapadatikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namani Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sadi Gauravakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Vancha Kalpata Rupyascha, Kripa Sindupya Evacha, Patita Nampa Vanipyo, Vaishnavipyo Namo Namah. Happy Akadashi to you all. Akadashi Devi Ki Jai, Vaishnav Thakur Ki Jai. Um, I was kind of like really kind of mulling over for for a few days about wh who and which which topic to speak about and how to kind of frame this lecture um and that's kind of because every time i i've planned a specific personality I and i'm like oh their disappearance day is coming so then maybe i should i'll switch it up but then that leaves me and I'm like, well, then what do I talk about for this week? Uh, and so there's a, there's a certain personality that I've been really every, for the past, at least two, three goddesses. I'm like, oh, I'll speak about that personality. I've been wanting to speak about this particular pastime. And then I'm like, wait, their, their disappearance is coming up. I'm like, is it the next one? And then I keep going. I'm like, it's not this one. It's the next one. Like it's not, it's the next one. So I, I really do, honestly, unless the calendar plays more tricks on me, um, it will be the very next Akadashi that I will finally speak about the personality that i've been <laughs> uh, they, they've been playing hide and seek with everyone but, uh, <laughs> but for this ikadashi i i kind of have been really thinking about what what happens to us in our lives how do we deal with the things that happen to us in our lives and i feel as though very few people exemplify this like kunti devi and so this, this lecture is framed around Kunti Devi and, and her life. And usually when we think about Kunti Devi, we think about one section in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Right? That's, that's our go-to. That's our, our one key episode. Uh, but we don't really think about much else. And uh, Kunti Devi's life was kind of bookended by so many happenings this prayers of queen kunti are like the culmination of things that happen uh and we kind of see her kind of towards the end of of her life and you start to wonder was that the culmination of her surrender was that the only time that she surrendered uh and the answer is no she had been kind of surrendering all along um and and those are the ones that have become like ISKCON famous. But there are many other times that she was surrendering that I, it bears speaking about, mentioning, 
reflecting on one of them because why not if you are the supreme person and we have spoken about lord Nisimhadev and the transcendental greed of the lord as Gaur Govinda Maharaj wonderfully puts it the lord develops certain greed a greediness for relationships he develops a greediness for different kinds of love and so lord Nisimhadev has this He's looking at Prahlad Maharaj, Prahlad Maharaj is looking at him, and Prahlad looks at the Lord in the, in the way that he would look at an all-loving, amazing father. Lord Nisimhadev kind of looks at the situation. Where's my father? He looks at the pillar. He goes, I guess that's my father, but I can't really have loving relationships with a pillar. And so the Lord resolves at that moment that, fine, every time I come back from here on out, I'm going to have parents. And because Krishna is always extra, you know, if you're Krishna, why not have two sets of parents? You know, like what what, what could be better? If, if he's greedy for relationships, he's going to have all the parents. And in that case, he, he decides in a stroke of wonderful Lila genius that all of the boys and calves will be kidnapped and for a year, he will literally have all the parents, all of them, every parent within Vrindavan. And so if Krishna has some greediness, he's going to take it to the extreme. So Kunti Devi is the, the sister of one of Krishna's parents. And she has a life which you would not think Krishna's aunt would have. If you think of the family members of God, immediately we would think, oh, well, you know, from where we're sitting, they're going to have it easy. They're going to have a wonderful situation. This was not so for Kunti. Uh, Kunti's situation was brought with, as me and my sister would like to say, material worldliness from the very beginning. Uh, she was born to Maharaj Surasena, the well, father of Vasudev, but he gives her to Kunti Bhoj, his brother, because Kunti Bhoj had no children. Um, and we, we will see this happen quite often within Vedic literature, this giving in charity of children, if you have none. Um, and a lot of it happens, particularly with female children. And this the reason for it is not because female children um, which sometimes we can we can wind up thinking it's like it's throwaway kid you know just uh, but also because these female children literally signify the opulence and the wealth and the abundance of a family they signify the continuation of an entire society it is said that once you perform the wedding of a female child it's as if you have done all all charitable activities Everybody's always like looking to do the most charitable thing. But this organizing the wedding of a female child is one of the most charitable things you could ever do in your entire life. So actually, it's not. It's, 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 a, it's a giving of wealth. So Kunti Devi is given to Kunti Bodh and she is thus named Kunti. And she goes and as big fathers are wont to do, uh, there is a sage that comes to their home. Durvasa Muni arrives on the scene. And Durvasa Muni often arrives on the scene in very many cases. And Vedically, the father says to the child, okay, serve this sage nicely. And the hope is that if the child serves the sage nicely, they will get unlimited blessings. And we kind of but usually, in this case, interestingly enough, it's the male children. Like, if we think about today's society, it's like, you know, there's a, there's a sannyasi and they're going on pilgrimage, they're going on to many different places, and take the child, you know? I have very many friends who have spent years traveling and gaining blessings. Um, but, vedically, 
it, it wasn't just the, the male children. A lot of Vedic fathers would specifically send the female children, go serve this age, because these blessings last for lifetimes. They often trickle down through generations. Uh, we see even in the case of Shrimati Radharani, she also served this age, also happened to be Durvasa Muni. And when he was pleased with her, not just her, but all of the gopis, he gave her a benediction that whatever she would cook, whoever tasted it, they would never age, they would never fall sick, they would have the benefit of a long life. She would never even have to cook the same thing twice. So these are the, the benedictions that come from these great sages and they come upon all of society, both, both sets of children. Uh, and in this vein, that is one of the benedictions that enables Radharani to cook for Krishna every day. Because where Radharani's elders might protest that she's going to Yashodharani's palace every day and cooking for Krishna, but we all know Everybody in Vrindavan knows, like under under the surface, you know, it's, it's they can't quite put their finger on it, but something is happening between this princess of Braj and the prince of Braj, and we can't quite figure it out. But something, and it, it something about it seems a little bit like we we feel like we want to stop it, but we can't really stop it, but we want to be concerned. But also, we're not quite sure what we're concerned about. So where the elders might pose all of these objections, Radharani's blessing comes to save the day. And then everybody thinks, oh, well, but, but she did get the blessing from Durvasa Muni. And wouldn't we all want Krishna to have a long and healthy life? I mean, every, that's all anybody, anybody wants. So all of the objections go completely out the window. In this case, Kunti Devi, many years prior, uh, is serving Durvasa Muni. And he gives her a very special mantra. And at this time that she gets this mantra, she's about 13 or 14. She's quite young. Um, and what he says is, I will give you a mantra by which you can call any of the celestial gods to you. And then he gives the mantra. And then that's it. There, there's a manual. Uh, there's no, there's no instructional guide. There's no IKEA. How do you put this together? Guide. There's no. What are the consequences of this guide? There's no. There's he, he makes sure that she knows how to chant the mantra properly. And then that's it. And so uh, this actually. I find that this happens with us and our blessings quite often. We get a blessing, sometimes that we don't even know is a blessing at the time, and there's no instruction manual. The best things in life do not come with instruction manual. Children, blessings, houses, none of it. Life plops these situations in our laps and then that's it. And so Kunti Devi has this blessing now. And she goes on about her life. And one day, she's looking at the sun. Because don't we all? It's, it's pretty majestic. You get sunrises and sunsets. And it can be so incredibly magical. She's looking at the sun. At sunrise. And she thinks how wonderful it would be maybe just to see the sun god. And then she remembers in all of her... 14 year old wisdom that she can see the sun god if if the mantra is what it says it is and it does what it says it will do and so she thinks let me use it and once my sister and I were reading this Mahabharat to our Sunday school girls it was a mixed group actually girls and a couple of Boys, and some of them were about 13 or 14. And we kind of asked them, what would you do? And they said, for sure. Of course, yeah. 
We'd call the sun god. Why not? Seems like a fun thing. And so, uh, she uses the mantra. Lo and behold, bright lights flash. All of the, the scenery changes. It's like a whole, you know, optic illusion. It's wonderful. Everything, the, everything else dims. There's bright lights in front. Just to shield her eyes. And then there is the sun god in all of his glory. Kunti is amazed. It worked. How wonderful. The sun god says, what can I do for you? She says, nothing. She says, well, sure it was working. It is working. Wonderful. You can go back now. Uh, the sun god says, well, this is not how this works. So what, how what works? Because she wasn't given an instruction manual. Uh, and the sun god says, well, I, I can't leave without giving you a blessing. Says, no problem. Uh, however, in this case, the blessing is a child. And Kunti Devi is now mortified. She had no idea. In, in her innocence, which sometimes we can think of, you know, later on what happens is a lot of people start to judge our acharyas by small snapshots of their lives. And how wonderful are our acharyas that willingly they will take on situations that they know might cause them to be judged for time immemorial, like for the rest of eternal time. If you were leading your life thinking, future generations are going to write about every single moment of this. And not only are they going to write about it for the rest of time, but they're going to use it for the rest of time. They might judge me for this. They might use it for their own agendas. They might use it to further their own whatever, you know, all of their, their arguments throughout life. They might use it to justify different arguments in life. That's a heavy weight. It's a big responsibility to shoulder. And she's still just 14. So once again, we asked our girls, those of you who are 14, what would you do? How do you handle that? What do you feel? If all of a sudden somebody comes and says, well, no, but now you've got to have a child. A lot of them were equally as mortified. You could see it on their faces. I don't, I don't need what I, I just want to collect stickers and, and do art. Like, I didn't, this is not what I wanted to do. Likewise, Kunti is terrified. She's thinking, I'm young. I'm not married. All of the hopes of my lineage are on me. Everyone is telling me about societal pressures, etc. What my role is going to be, all of these things, and now you want me to have a child? I can't explain this to anybody. I can't do this. The sun god says, well, I mean, you'll still be a maiden. It'll be fine. Like, I, I don't know how that was supposed to help her. Like, that was supposed to be the consolation. You'll still be a maiden. But, like, she's just like, I, I might still be a maiden. I'll still, but I'll have a child. And the sun god says, well, this is how it goes, unfortunately. And fortunately. And so, by mantra, because it's the wonderful thing about uh, Vedic literature is in these Vedic times. Um, childbirth never happens the way that we think it happens nowadays. Ever. I'm, I'm looking at so many Vedic, Vedic histories and it's kind of rare that conception even happens the way we think that it happens. Like that was the minority case. The majority of cases were fire sacrifices, mantra, babies grown in pots, Babies grown by clumps of grass, babies carried by river, children just appearing, children coming from dreams, children appearing in the heart, children like it was kind of the 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 minority of cases where conception happened the way that we think it happens now. So by mantra, 
Quinty had a child. And in very many cases, this child was born from her ear. Well, because mantra, right? So, and so from her ear, which is why, one of the reasons, the name of the child was Karna, which means ear. Uh, and so this child was named Karna, and Kunti, in all of her 14-year-old wisdom, once again, is looking at this child, somewhere between 14 and 16, which is you really feel ill-equipped to make these decisions. And sometimes people think, well, when I got married at an earlier age and things were happening, it was a different time. And like, their lifespans went to 100 or so more. So I feel like even more so, they were definitely at a stage where they were not handling this kind of responsibility. As it happens, the children weren't even going to school until sometimes five, sometimes eight, sometimes after. Um, and so Kunti is in a very precarious situation. She has no idea what to do. She consults her maidservants. They all have a powwow, but the maidservants aren't much older than she is. And so it's like trying to get a, get a whole bunch of teenaged girls together and have them solve this issue of a baby. It sounds like the makings of a television show with an after-school special moral of the story. And so Kunti comes to the only wise conclusion that she can. She wants to kind of give the child away. She can't give the child away because then they would ask questions. Everybody's going to ask, well, where did the child come from? Whose child is this? What? How did you get this child? Why do you have this child? All these things. And so she goes to the river, puts the child in a basket. She decorates the child, swaddles the child in costly silks and blankets and anything that she has. And then she prays to the sun god, you've given me this child. Your eyes are everywhere. Nothing is hidden from you. And so if you have given me this child, can you please protect this child? It is often said that the sun god responds, no problem, I'll protect my son. He was also born with armor, real armor, which I think must look really adorable on a baby. Uh, golden shining armor and earrings. So this child is celestial. So Kunti puts her celestial child in this basket and then puts the basket on the river and sends it along with a prayer and a hope that somehow or other this child might make it. And then Kunti has to go on with her life. Uh, it is not an easy thing to forget. In fact, she doesn't forget it. It stays with her. So if we want to talk about you know, childhood trauma and all of these different things that Kunti knows all about it. Our Acharyas know all about it. Uh, they are not blind to the situations that we go through in our lives. And so sometimes we can think, well, when hard things happen to us, we think, okay, well, yeah, hard things happen, but those are pure devotees. And then when the pure devotees are saved, we think, yeah, they got saved. But those are pure devotees. At what point do we actually understand that these leelas, as these, as I said before, these wonderful acharyas, they take on the, the, the burden of understanding that these situations in their lives will be recorded for all of antiquity. For um, these, these leelas are for us. Yes, these acharyas, these great personalities, these pure devotees, they went through so many things, but these leelas are for us. For us to be able to understand that we are not alone. And also for us to understand that Krishna saves his devotees. 
of which we are some. Like at what point do we stop adding the, the caveat of, yeah, but the pure devotees. I don't think he only saves the pure devotees. I don't think so. I think he saves all the devotees. Like that's that's the thing about Krishna. If he does something, he's going to do it to the unlimited amount. He's not just going to have one set of parents. He's going to have all the parents. He's not just going to save one devotee. He's going to save all the devotees. That's that's just how he is. And so at what point do we start looking at the lives of the Vaishnava Acharyas and realizing that Krishna is saving people from unlimited circumstances? This is just to give us hope and encouragement and some solace and some soothing to our hearts, understanding that Krishna will save us too, even if we're not pure devotees. Look at Ajami. I have a whole section of Ajami. Now, there are, I know, there are people who will also say, oh, but he was a pure devotee. I'm like, okay. He was a pure devotee also with a little bit of an addiction issue to many things. So then what does that mean for us? At what point are we honestly looking at these things and saying, okay, I get it. The point is, Krishna will save us too. The point is no longer for us to beat ourselves up about it. That entire section of Srimad Bhagavatam, starting with the pastime of Ajamil, going through Gajendra, also looking at King Chitraketu and his turning into Ritrasura, uh, this section is to show us what happens when devotees make mistakes. And what happens when devotees make mistakes? Krishna saves them. Krishna saves them. And he saves them so many times without showing up and saying, I'm going to save you, but I told you so. Like, I'm going to save you. But first, I'm going to sit you down and have you feel all the guilt and the shame. and the th No! Krishna just saves his devotees in the sweetest, most compassionate way. So Kunti floats her child down the river. And we could use this for the rest of time to hold it against her and call her a bad mother. But also she was 14. Having a very incredible human-like experience, this pure devotee would become the aunt of the Supreme Personality of God. Having this very human-like experience having to do something that she was not proud of. Something that caused her to feel shame and guilt for a very long time. And the most amazing thing is that Krishna never held it against her. Krishna doesn't ever come to his own and say, well, you know, this all could have been avoided. You could have done better. You could have done a so and so, all these things, all whatever. Even her sons, at, toward the very end, they get angry. They rebuke their own mother. Not Krishna. It seems as though when all of these things happen, Krishna's job very many times and what he does is he holds the face of the person, smooths away their tears, and says, I, I, will, I will change things. I will save you. Whether our family members agree, whether society agrees, whether nobody agrees, Krishna comes, holds the face of the person, smooths away their tears, I'll make it better. That's our supreme person. The condemnation hasn't come from our supreme person. So, when she floats that child down the river, she eventually gets married. The child does live, spoiler alert. And as she gets married, as fate would have it, her blessing becomes an even greater blessing. And she has herself three more children. Yudhishthir, Bhima, 
and Arjuna. Then she lets her co-wife use the mantra. The co-wife has two twins, but then her husband dies, the co-wife dies, and now she has five children. She's got all of them. And after the death of her husband and she was living in the forest and kind of feeling like I have nowhere else left to go, she goes to the kingdom for all intents and purposes, the government. And so she goes for government assistance. So now we think of all the people that might seek government assistance with five children and how we might judge them today. Look at that, single mom five kids on the the Vedic version of welfare. It, it makes us really, if hopefully, if we are really thinking deeply about it, makes us think about how we look at other people. Because if Kunti were put in our society today in these terms, I don't know if we would be so open, purely wonderful. Let's re-sing her prayers all the time, every day. Let's talk about her all the time. Or whether we'd just be judging her. Looking at her, wondering, how do you get yourself in such a situation? It's so easy for us to heap the blame on other people. So Kunti goes to the, the, the ruling administration who's supposed to be her family. And then they systematically try to kill off her and her children often for the rest of the time that she's there. They were always living in fear at all times. Uh, and this is it's unconscionable. These are Krishna's cousins, cousin brothers. Because for, for Vedic terms, unless you were a far, far, far removed cousin, you were just brothers. Like in order for somebody to, you know, cousin, then a little farther removed, like second cousin or something, third cousin, then you were a cousin. But everybody else, you were just brothers. So these are Krishna's brothers. This is Krishna's family. For the rest of time, within Brihad Bhagavatamrita, within the rest of the Bhagavatam, there are countless devotees throughout the entirety of creation who are thinking, Krishna has done so much for his devotees, but look at what he's done for the Pandavas. He goes and he personally serves them. He becomes an ambassador. He becomes a chariot driver, which is not a high position. He, he rescues them. He stays with them. He speaks with them. He's, an, he's everything to them. Just look at the miraculous way our Lord is working. Celestials, demigods can't get the same audience, but Krishna has decided to make his appearance, sit within their family, and do whatever is necessary for them. This is the glory of Kunti Devi's family. But then that means that they also needed a lot of saving. Willing and ready, and he did everything for them, which means they needed a lot of doing. And so Kunti was sent to the forest again. They were almost set fire to in a home built specifically for them. One of her sons was poisoned. It was calamity after calamity after calamity, which brings upon us the famous verse that, you know, let the calamities come again and again. For by those calamities, we were enabled to see you, O Krishna. Amazing that someone with that much trauma could look at the entirety of the situation from such a mature vantage point and say, this is the price that we had to pay to be able to see you, Krishna, and it was worth it. How many of us, just looking at our little lives, with a little bit of trauma that we've had, or with a lot of bit of trauma, maybe, depending on how we're, how we're viewing it, 
how many of us are even are even saying this is the price that it takes to see Krishna face to face worth it 10 on 10 highly recommend how many of us how many of us even within the calamities are even saying huh Krishna saved me from that last one and I got to see my Krishna face to face through the miracle or are we just focused on you know what why did God have to make that happen? If I was really a devotee, if God really thought of me as a devotee, he wouldn't give me all these trials and tribulations. He wouldn't. Because I'm looking at his family. I'm looking at his entire family tree right now. His parents were in jail for years. This is his aunt and his cousins. These are the times where, oh, but those are pure devotees, those are pure devotees. Okay, so, so then really, Krishna wouldn't do this to his pure devotees because it seems like this par for the course. It, it's looking very material world-like. So how many of us can look at what has happened to us in life and really say, this is how we got to see Krishna. Are we seeing Krishna at the end of the tunnel? Are we looking for him at all? Or are we simply looking to get out of the calamity? There's one section of Krishna book. We're kind of like hidden in a chapter. Krishna does something that I really love. Krishna and all of his amazing majesty understands that Kunti Devi is in great distress. And he can't go to Hastinapur at that time to go check on her personally. So he sends an envoy. He sends Akrura. Akrura also happens to be a family member of Kunti Devi. And so he says, go to Hastinapur and check on the family. And as Akrura goes, he, he also speaks with Vidurashtra, he, he speaks with Vidura, he speaks with so many, but he speaks with Kunti. And hidden in this chapter, which is named Ill-Intentioned Dhritarashtra, is the name of this chapter? Ill-Motivated Dhritarashtra. Akrura speaks with Kunti, and Srila Prabhupada wonderfully sums up. Gradually, Akrura learned from Kunti and Vidura that the sons of Dhritarashtra were intolerant and envious of the five Pandava brothers because of their extraordinary learning in military science and their greatly developed bodily strength. The Pandavas acted as truly chivalrous heroes, exhibited all the good qualities of Kshatriyas, and were very responsible princes, always thinking of the welfare of the citizens. Akura also learned that the envious sons of Dhritarashtra had to kill the Pandavas by poisoning them. Um, this word, intolerant. You know, when we, when we think of tolerance we think of people with different life karmas than we have and i remember many many years ago before things have, have you know were different now um there were so many people who would talk about pride and different things and especially in new york because you know living in new york you get everything and there was such a distinction made between tolerance and acceptance. And this idea of tolerance or intolerance, like you, you think it's like literally letting somebody live and let live, literally. And in this case, you know, I always thought about it. I was like, is that really? Like, should that really be the definition of like tolerance? But even in this case, the sons of Dhritarashtra were intolerant. So this whole live and let live theory, it was, it was not. They were going to not live and let live. In fact, they were going to try and kill them off as many times as humanly possible, however they could get away with it, without obviously just walking into their rooms and killing them in the dead of night. Which I think they would have tried if they could have justified it. Anyway, they were, they were trying it any way they possibly could. 
so intolerant and envious. Akura happened to be one of the cousins of Kunti. Therefore, after meeting him, she began to inquire about her paternal relatives. Thinking of her birthplace and beginning to cry, she asked Akura whether her father, mother, brothers, sisters, and other friends at home still remembered her. She especially inquired about Krishna and Balaram, her glorious nephews. She asked, does Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is very affectionate to his devotees, remember my sons? Does Balaram remember us? Inside herself, Kunti felt like a she-deer in the midst of tigers, and actually her position was like that. After the death of her husband, King Pandu, she was supposed to take care of the five Pandava children, but the sons of Dhritarashtra were always planning to kill them. She was certainly living like a poor, innocent animal in the midst of several tigers. Being a devotee of Lord Krishna, she always thought of him and expected that one day Krishna would come and save them from their dangerous position. That expectation. We think about life and how many times therapists say that trauma comes from the, the expectation, right? This disappointment, all of these things, relationships break down from expectations. But there's one relationship that grows due to expectations, and that is our relationship with Krishna. We should expect prayers from Lord Brahma in chapter 14 of the 10th canto. We should expect Krishna's mercy. We should have the expectation that whatever it is I'm going through, Krishna will come and save me. One day, Krishna is going to save me. However he sees fit, one day Krishna is going to save me. And we should not think that this is just a pure devotee mentality. It's meant for every single one of us. Because all of us are going through trials and tribulations. The trials are not just for the pure devotees, they're going to be for all of us. So likewise, the miracles are not just for pure devotees. They're going to be for all of us. It is our job to place those expectations that I'm going to expect Krishna's mercy come hell or high water. No matter what it is. I'm going to expect Krishna's mercy. And if I'm going through a lot of trouble, then I'm going to expect a lot of mercy. Brahma says it has become our birthright, our rightful claim. So then fine, I expect unlimited blessings then. And then that expectation can slowly turn into a loving demand. Lord, I've gone through so much. I demand the blessings any moment now. And with that mentality, we should cling to our chanting cling to our, our, our java, cling to our reading, cling to these, these examples. Because as much as she went through, Krishna saved her. And not only did he save her, but he didn't just leave her alone. Oh, well, you know, I wasn't thinking about you. You were over there, I was over here, out of sight, out of mind. He saw Akura on her, specifically. Go and see how my aunt and the Pandavas are doing, please. So when Krishna sends us envoys, when Krishna sends us miracles and blessings, let us revel in those moments, just as Kunti Devi is doing. And I'll end with just this. Talking with Akura about all of the affairs that she had been going through, she felt helpless and exclaimed, my dear Krishna, my dear Krishna, you are the supreme mystic the super soul of the universe. You are the real well-wisher of the whole universe. Oh, my dear Govinda, at this time you are far away from me, yet I pray to surrender unto your lotus feet. I am now grief-stricken with my five fatherless sons. I can fully understand that but for your lotus feet, there is no shelter or protection. Your lotus feet can deliver all aggrieved souls because you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One can be safe from the clutches of repeated birth and death by your mercy only. My dear Krishna, you are the Supreme Pure One. 
the super soul, and the master of all yogis. What can I say? I can simply offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Accept me as your fully surrendered devotee. Although Krishna was not present before her, Kunti offered prayers to him as if she were in his presence face to face. This is possible for anyone following in the footsteps of Kunti. Krishna does not have to be physically present everywhere. He is actually present everywhere by spiritual potency, and one simply has to surrender unto him sincerely. So we should know that Krishna is present, and we can pray. And the moment that we pray, we can see him face to face. So sometimes the calamities are the price we pay. The good thing is, some of us have already paid some prices. We've already been paid. So we don't have to think that, oh no, all the things are coming again. We've already paid. Now, now it's our rightful claim. This mercy belongs to each and every one of us. Thank you so much for allowing me to be with you on this Akadashi morning. It is my great joy and privilege and blessing. Thank you, thank you. Akadashi Devi Ki Jai, Kunti Maharani Ki Jai, all glorious to our Krishna's mercy. Ki Jai. Jai, thank you very much. Beautiful class of Shiva Gopi, as always. Um, so we're going to open it up for some reflections and questions. Uh, it's beyond, it's past eight, but still it's Sunday, so let's do it. Uh, my reflect, I'm going to start, I'll take my, I'll take advantage of hosting this class. So my reflection is that no calamities, no miracles. That's my, that's my type of way. Okay. Please, uh, hand raised. Hey, Krishna. Oh, I just want to say thank you so much. What a beautiful class. You have covered it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, forgiveness, trauma, unplanned children. Thank you very much. <laughs> beautiful class. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, Sharadia. Hare Krishna, Chitta Gopi. I'm so happy this is Krishna Sunday so I could listen. Um, one thing that came to my mind when you were speaking, and I've also thought about this, is how, um, you know, Kunti, if we look at her life, she may not fit our idea of like stereotypical pure devotee. And I was thinking, you've got anything to share, like if Quinty would like show up in our devotee society today, you know, if like, you know, a free marital child being born, five children, single mom, how do you think, like, honestly, would a devotee community respond to such a person? And could they actually value them for the devotee they are? Or would they get caught up? social examples of their condition. I mean, uh, isn't that a problem for all of us? Um, how would ISKCON deal with it? We're all here, we're all part of ISKCON, you know? It's, it's, up for, it's up to us to really search within ourselves and think about the way we look at people because she does show up. I've seen people, I've known people, they do show up. And how do we treat them? Um, and, and funny enough, you're saying, you know, would she get caught up? It's actually the other, it's, it's, it's us that get caught up. And in this, in this vein, it bears in, in, in mind what Srila Prabhupada spoke to Bhakti Chaita Maharaj. Bhakti Chaita Maharaj went and he said, you know, so Prabhupada, there's a lot of there's a lot of racism in your movement. And Srila Prabhupada's response was It's true. Uh, don't let their Maya become your Maya. Because how we are perceiving uh, a living entity going through material world circumstances, one that might look like Kunti Devi's 
external circumstances. How we perceive her, she doesn't get caught up. We get caught up. That's an us issue. She's going to go about her life and continue to depend on Krishna's mercy. She will be the recipient of Krishna's mercy. For all time to come. We are the ones that are forever maligned and caught up in this entangling web of material world designations, thinking this is my enemy and this is my friend. This is my social companion and this is not. And, uh, and so it is so interesting that we have to look at how we perceive other devotees. That's an us question. It has nothing to do with, with Kunti Devi whatsoever and everything to do with are we are we preaching this Krishna consciousness for everybody or are we putting the limitation on Krishna? Are we putting the limitations on Krishna because we've looked at them and determined, oh, they can't understand the philosophy. They'll never be able to get it. This, this is not for them. So in this, you know, in this case, we even, we hear about Mahabharata. We hear about so many of these things, and it's for the women and the less intelligent. So in, in that vein, I've, I've decided to adopt uh, parental raising strategies. Um, if, if you've ever been a parent or you've ever been around kids for a long time, and you have something that you really like, and they want a bite of it, you start to learn to protect your food, right? The things that you really, really like, because you don't have that much. Um, and, and the kids, once they get one bite, they want another one. It's like if you give a mouse a cookie. Uh, and so what, what you say to them is, oh, no, you wouldn't like it. It's too spicy. You wouldn't like it. And then the kid's like, it's spicy? And they're like, yeah, it's really spicy. And then they, go, oh, and then they walk away, you know? And then you eat your cake in peace. Or like you drink your slushy, which is not spicy at all. That you've now told the child is spicy. Um, I've I've decided to adopt that with with many different things, uh, especially when it comes to Mahabharat and definitely certain cantos of Shrimad Bhagavatam. People come, what are you reading? Oh no, you wouldn't like it. It's for women and less intelligent. You wouldn't like it. This is for this is totally for the women and the less intelligent. You don't want this. Um, but it's because it gives me so much solace. Reading about Kunti Devi's story helps, and it makes me feel so much better. Helps me deepen my connection with Krishna so much to an extent that okay, it's cool. It's okay if you get it. It's gonna go right over your head. No problem. I, I, more for me. And and that's how we kind of have to look at it, um, because we are going to be in situations where others might try and hamper Krishna consciousness. They might be looking at us according to some external designation. And that's them getting caught up, not us. If we can remember what the real goal is, then we won't get caught up. Their maya won't become our maya. Their illusion won't become our illusion. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. It does hurt. Kunti Devi was crying. Telling Krishna, I take full surrender. I, 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 please accept me. I'm fully surrendered. She said, fully surrendered. Crying, though. So don't think that the surrender means we never show any emotion. We don't show that it doesn't hurt. It hurts. But our job is to continue to have that faith. To expect mercy from our friend. Because that's our relationship. I have issues. My friend saves me. And so it's, it's up to us to know that we are going to go through things in life that don't look perfect. They don't look like the quintessential version of a pure devotee, but who does? Who does? Haridas Thakur? He was born in a Muslim family. How many of us are looking at other devotees and ready, willing to accept all the people? How many of us? There are so many people that have come to me with questions and, and heartaches saying, oh, I found somebody and they're wonderful and I'm in a relationship with them, but no one wants me to be in a relationship with this person because this person's not a devotee. 
We all know someone who at one point wasn't a devotee. Most of those people we have taken spiritual shelter from. If Srila Prabhupada looked at anybody and said, oh no, I can't accept them because they're not a devotee, we would not have a movement. Not only do we all know someone who at some point was not a devotee, pure or otherwise, we might have been someone who was not a devotee, pure or otherwise. So when we look at it with these designations, we have to understand that this is the illusion. This is my enemy and this is my friend. And this is what Prahlad Maharaj is urging us from the time he was five. And he's got a long life. Urging us, begging us to stop doing. So my answer is for us, don't let their maya become our maya. No matter how we think somebody might look at somebody else, no matter how we even see it, because we'll see it, especially on social media. We'll see it. Our job is to not let Maya become our Maya. Our job is to look at it and say, hmm, everybody says these people can't understand Krishna. Maybe I see it differently. Maybe that's up for Krishna to decide. Because if Mahaprabhu did that, we wouldn't have a movement. Kirtan would still be in the temple for the Brahmins. And only a select few of them. But now it's for everyone because Mahaprabhu did not look and say, only these people can understand Krishna. He understood that just as every single heart has the capacity to love, it's because every heart has the capacity to love Krishna. And each other. I hope that kind of answered the question. But uh, Hugo, come on, ask your question. Hi, Krishna. With that, with that last point, um, in this case, it's the idea of the single mother with five children, or it could be anyone based on gender, racial background, socioeconomics, etc. But when that question was raised, uh, Prabhupada past time came to my mind um, a very lovely one. That sucks for Upanar, I remember, mm. where in the mid 70s, there were so many people coming to the temples and living in the temples. And with the men, it was pretty okay because often they had no attachments. They just left everything. So they go out on books, they do the service, they fix up the temple, they do, every, they do everything. But then an issue started coming up, and that a lot of single mothers were coming into the temples and to the movement. And the temples were taking them in, but it was economically unfeasible because they couldn't do service. They couldn't take care of the temple. They couldn't do et cetera because they had their children to take care of. And now there are two mouths to feed at the temple and there's nothing in return. So the GBC, the, the organizers of ISKCON, they, they decided on a re resolution like, okay, like no more single mothers at the temples because we just can't sustain it. And then the GBC was meeting with Prabhupada because they would meet with Prabhupada, list out the resolutions and say, you know, Prabhupada, is this okay? You say yes, that's okay. And then, okay, is this okay? And I say yes. So Satsuru Maharaj speaks that they were having this meeting and they were going through the resolutions one by one and Prabhupada would just sit there and he would nod. That's, that's fine. Yes, that's fine. Just nod. And that's like, okay, this is passed. But then they brought up that resolution. No more single mothers in our temples. And Sri Prabhupada, rather than nodding, he just sat there and thought, and just silently. And Satsuru Maharaj looked up and he saw this. And he says, uh, Prabhupada, I guess, uh, I guess we're not passing this resolution, so we'll just put it aside, right? And Prabhupada just sits there for a moment longer in silence. And then he says, I just want to give Krishna consciousness to as many people as possible. And there's a story I heard of with Ella's question, and it just, it really strikes the heart. It's, yeah, so I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you, Hare Krishna. It's so interesting. Um, I never, I never envy people in positions of managerial situations. 
I don't, I don't envy them at all. I'm like, you can have it. <laughs> um, but also we, it, it wasn't just hard for single mothers. Um, my mom was in the temple at the time and she wasn't a single mom. Both my parents were there and it was hard for grahastas. It was, it was hard for anybody who was not in the, the machine per se of, of going out on book distribution. However, let us never underestimate, you know, what we, we kind of think, you know, it's, like it's hard for a single mom, like, except for nine times out of 10, even, even with a whole family involved, the mom will tie the child onto her back and go work. New Vrindavan was, was with women with children. Gitanagari was filled with women with children. There were, there were people that were having children. Uh, and very many friends of mine grew up in that era. They're like, yeah, no. Our moms, they would cook in the kitchen and the, the kids, they would have a, at one point they literally had like a little, like they set up a playpen in the kitchen the babies in the playpen and then they went and they did their service there were so many times and and you know Shiva Prabhupada, they asked him about so many oh what do we do with the children all the things but this children is your service we we think you know oh we there's so many mouths to feed and all this stuff and we're thinking about logistics is it really what are what are these logistics when it comes to living entities? Are we thinking about people as living entities? Or are they just numbers? It's just an extra number. It's what that many more grains of rice? Like, is it really that much? It's like, oh, now there's two mouths to feed. Oh my goodness. What are we going to do? And I'm like that child, really? That child was taken up so much, huh? And and children, when you when you raise them in that in that con condition where we're thinking of each other as living entities, children are resilient. They adjust. This is what everybody's doing. This is Krishna consciousness. So how how different would it be? if we gave ourselves the opportunity to think of other devotees with love instead of such cynicism, we can become really uh, jaded. And we're always thinking, oh, but this is where it starts. And then next thing you know, it all goes downhill and then everything is ruined. And I'm kind of like, well, maybe let's see what happens before the ruination. Maybe some good things can happen before everything is ruined. Um, and so I, I really, I appreciate the thinking of living entities, of giving Krishna consciousness to as many people as possible. I he's willing to, to, to walk that talk. It's not something he's just going to say. He's going to follow through with it. Also, what a resolution to pass. What do you what do you do with it? Where do they I I don't envy anybody in a managerial position. <laughs> That's all I can say. I don't envy anybody in a man and man managerial position because I Jai Hare Krishna. Lila Manjri. Hare Krishna. Good morning. Um so many good points so many good points this morning um one of the things that kind of struck me was when akura was talking with kunti and she asked does does my krishna remember me does my balaram remember me because i'm thinking about the scenario that led up to that moment and it's like that wasn't just like you know she's having the conversation and it pops in her brain that's like deep heart something that's like 
she had that resonating in her. And then Krishna creates the scenario where, you know, the personality comes and she's able to reveal her mind. And I mean, first off, it just gives so much permission to be real, permission to be there and be like, okay, yeah, because I have those moments, you know, to find inspiration. Like the question is, like, I tend to go through really probably could be benefited if I revealed my mind to an authority, if I revealed my mind to a friend, if I revealed, mm. but I'm always thinking I've got this, you know, like I'm praying about it. I'm, 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 you know, Krishna, you and me, but, but it was like Kunti, she was praying about it. She was there, but she didn't, she didn't stop there. She, she did reveal herself. And then from that, she got like the fast blessing <laughs> she didn't have like wonder she got the, the confirmation that like yes krishna is but it's like how do we deal with our own minds when our minds say this isn't a big enough thing to seek help with this isn't mm. big enough like mm -hmm. you know and not that i'm not like praying or seeking help from krishna but maybe i could use that fast forward button of like community and it's like the reason we're in community but i'm not playing the community card because it's like oh I don't want a burden, you know, I'll just keep it in my little prayer moment. Hmm. Yeah, I think it, there's several factors about that really amazing question. Uh, one of them is about finding a safe space. Not all of Kunti's community was safe. Some of the community was trying to kill her. <laughs> Some of the community was the issue. Um, so we have to make sure that we are finding a safe space and she revealed her heart and her mind to Akura. And funny enough, we don't get that Akura does anything to her. <laughs> it's like she, she unburdens her mind and then she begins to pray to Krishna as though they were face to face. And it's almost like that prayer becomes the answer. It's almost like speaking it out loud and giving voice to those emotions is the thing that is the fast forward button that we're looking for. But as long as it stays up here, we don't give voice to it. We don't give words to it. Sometimes we feel like giving words to it would make it too real. But we're actually already going through it. It's real. It's happening. It might not be permanent, like, right? Like our material world experience is temporary, but very real. So when we hear, you know, this, oh, the material world, just it's, it's illusion. Some of us can feel really triggered because it's like, but I'm hurt. This, I feel this, this is hurting me. So yes, it's not permanent, but it's very real, our experience. Just like in a dream, we may understand that this is a dream and it's not permanent, but it definitely feels extremely real while it's happening. So sometimes giving voice to it and, and having that fear, but... If I give voice to this and if I talk about it, then it'll make it more real. No. Actually, it's already happening. That giving voice to it is the beginning of that cosmic conversation that we need to have. Giving voice to those emotions, giving, even if you're going to write yourself, even if you're writing, about it, you go to your altar and you say, Oh, Shri Prabhupada, I'm having this issue giving that voice to what we're going through starts this conversation of prayer it kickstarts all of these prayers and what happens is when we kickstart the prayers then the responses of mercy come back it's like a nice little reciprocated boomerang we pray krishna sends the mercy and so we don't necessarily have much that akura says to kunti he then goes and says a lot to dhritarashtra like, you should really reassess your values in yourself because this whole situation is not going in the way that it's going to make anybody proud or happy. So he says a lot to do chakra, but he doesn't say that much to Kunti. And so sometimes we can feel as though we'll unburden our heart and we're expecting somebody to give us this big answer. Krishna's mercy is already giving it to us, though these prayers we get those answers and sometimes the answer is 
It's, oh, Krishna, I'm going through this. But you know what? Even just talking about it is reminding me that, okay, no matter what, I signed up to surrender. I signed up for, for surrender. And so as I'm going through this, I'm going to keep surrendering. And Lord, I know you're going to keep helping. That's my expectation. I have so many expectations for you, Lord. But if anyone can fulfill them, it's Krishna. And if anyone will fulfill them, it's Krishna. And not only will Krishna fulfill those expectations, but he will send people to let you know, I'm still thinking about you. I really like that, that how she starts off. So poignant, like you said. Does he remember me? Does Balaram remember me? And of course, you know, the answer is always, yes, of course he remembers you. And just knowing that Krishna remembers you starts to make all of these things bloom in the heart. Well, then if my friend remembers me, then let me tell my friend what I'm going through. And that's why Krishna is sending these people. Not because we should hold it in and never speak about it and we should never, like, you know, humble and tolerant doesn't mean that we're not hurt. Humble and tolerant doesn't mean we never speak about what happened to us. Humble and tolerant means that as the things are happening, no matter what is happening, we continue to seek shelter in Krishna. Which is why I really love this little hidden chapter. I remember reading one time and I was like, this is not what this chapter seemed like it was about. <laughs> it's ill-motivated Dhritarashtra. But it's such a beautiful little small section of Kunti praying in the midst of the dangers. First canto, we hear about Kunti praying after the calamities. But now she's literally in the midst of it, living through it, crying about it, but still also remembering that Krishna is so sweet. Did, did Saradi ask you questions? Saradi, you had more questions. I read in the chat. No. Hi, Krishna. Yes, I did have one more question. Actually, two more, but I'll just ask one, if I may. Achita Gopi Nation? Sure. Yeah. So, Achita Gopi Babu, you were mentioning that when Kanti Devi was facing that very challenging situation of Karna, up there was born. You said that the time you used, you said that she was having a very human experience, despite her being anybody. So I wanted to know if you could elaborate on how we can understand like the human experience of a peer devotee. Because I've seen sometimes um, if we see like a peer devotee and they go through, you know, like a human experience, then either we, you know, we won't acknowledge that that's actually happening, we deny it, or other times we might lose faith in it. So like, well, they're a peer devotee, yeah? they should never have, you know, a challenge or face such issues, not, not face the issues, but, you know, m make like a, like a, like, you know, act in a human way, because we can completely emphasize why she acted, as you said, that like, any, like, 14-year-old girl would have been overwhelmed and, and probably couldn't, like, you know, in her circumstances have kept the baby. So how do we, how do we understand that someone can be a beauty body at the same time have a human experience? Yeah. Um, I think at a certain point, we have to continue to put these situations in very real terms. And, and this, this goes for everything in our Krishna consciousness. Can we put it in real terms? Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that everyone from Brahma down to the ant is struggling with the six senses which include the mind. He says everybody. He doesn't say, well, everybody except you pure devotees. He says everyone is struggling with the six senses which include the mind. And we should expect that everybody's going to struggle. Krishna said, not me. But expect 
then everyone is going to struggle. The problem comes in when we expect the opposite. Everybody's on a pedestal, nobody should ever struggle. Uh, and those absolute terms don't do us any good. We should be expecting that people are going to struggle. And then when we see them struggling, how we handle their struggle determines our maya and our karma. Has nothing to do with the other person. It's like how we're viewing Koti. How we, how we react about that other person's struggle determines our level of illusion and our entangling karma. So we have to look at, okay, what does this mean for me? Sometimes it means nothing. In which case, we can offer compassionate prayers and go on with our Krishna conscious lives, and we absolutely should. Sometimes I kind of feel like, unless I am Yamaraj or one of his deputed servants, somebody else's karma is not my business. Unless I'm Yamaraj or Krishna, it's not my business. And then it's, you know, about Bhakti Maharaj <clears throat> talks about us all being in a school. Everybody's in school. In a hospital. So everybody's in a hospital. Do we look at the person who is almost an, in remission and put them on a pedestal because they're almost in remission? And then if they have some sort of relapse or they go out of remission or their illness comes back, like, oh no, that's it. Can't believe this thing. We offer compassion, understanding that a When we look at people who are ill and you can see the physical illness, as many times as they battle it, we start to call them a hero. When we see people in spiritual situations, because we're all spiritually ill, and we see them battling different difficulties and circumstances, the more they battle it, the more we call them a failure. How does that happen? How is that? We see people struggling with illness and we say, oh my goodness, you're such a hero. You're so brave. You're so this and resilient and you're strong and all whatever. And you heap all the glories. And then when we see somebody spiritually struggling, like you're such a failure. I can't believe you did this. I can't believe, I cannot believe that you had an issue. I'm sorry, but we're all in the material world. And there but for the grace of God go I. Which is exactly what Kunti is saying. But for your mercy, Krishna, we would not have been saved. But for your mercy, Krishna, I would not. But for your mercy, Krishna, one wrong step and I also. Who knows? Wrong step. So when we are thinking about any anyone else's hardships, unless we are that person's spiritual master, sometimes unless that person is our spiritual master, unless we are in that authoritative section of society, sometimes it is really important for us to look and say, okay, what do I do with my small life, my little circle? Because that's all I can do. We might not be able to change the world. In fact, we probably won't be able to change the world. That idea of us being able to change the world is how we got into the material world in the first place. We've decided we've, we've got it all. We can handle it. I've, I'm going to be in charge and I'm going to fix this whole thing material world spoiler alert it's not broken that's how it's set up so there are going to be struggles we should expect that and then we think about it in terms of how we would look at somebody struggling in a hospital do i get to say that my illness is better than your illness i don't think i do we're all in a hospital I don't, I don't think I get to say, you know what, what I'm dealing with is way better 
than your illness and what you're dealing with. And so I think that you're a failure. And the other person's like, oh, I was just trying to get well. Like, I, I'm just, I'm dealing with what's happening with my body. A lot of this is out of my control. And they're like, well, you failed because it's out of your control. So it, it's really important for us to look at our spiritual community and our community members, which turn out to be the whole world, and understand here's a person suffering, they're battling something. Now this might feel like a little less of a, you know, revenge plot, but okay. Sometimes it's not about the revenge. Sometimes it's about us becoming more compassionate devotees. What if the moral of that person going through is to make us more compassionate? What if the lesson is not about them at all? What if it's about us becoming more dear to Krishna? What if it's about us softening our hearts? My Guru Maharaj always says that Krishna is fond of stealing butter and so we have to make our hearts soft as butter so that Krishna will come and steal them. So what if somebody going through other situations is not about them at all? What if the moral of our story is, how am I seeing this? Have I completely written off this other person because they're ill? Have I underestimated my own illness? Am I, am I questioning? Am I sitting there like, oh, no problem. My illness is way better than their illness and I'm not dealing with that, so it's fine. I can cast all the judgment on that person because of what they're going through. Or can I just say, I can offer a compassionate prayer because my illness is in a different stage right now. I can give that. My, my mom would always say to me whenever I was going through a rough time, she said, she would always say, Chita, your currency in life is love. And Krishna is so merciful that you can afford to be generous. So I kind of feel that way with prayer. Those moments where I'm looking at somebody battling their illness heavier than I am. I'm rich in prayer at the moment. Some days we don't have it. Some days we need all the prayers. But some days we find ourselves a little more rich in prayer. Those are the days when we can offer that compassion. Doesn't mean you excuse, doesn't mean you forget, like all the other stuff that comes with it. I, you know what? Fine, whatever. But we can offer a compassionate prayer because somebody's struggling. Doesn't mean you have to enable it, doesn't mean you have to excuse it, doesn't mean you have to do anything. But pray and I expect that Krishna can and will handle these things. Especially if we are in, in situations where we are not in managerial positions and or yama. Mm. Charity has one last question that she put in the chat about Karna. Um, do we know anything about Karna's next life? I've read books specifically about Karna, but the author didn't redeem him in any way. She was saying that, you know, Karna's life was quite tragic. And he winds up being killed by one of his own brothers. Um, you know, we, we look at it and it ends there. Karna's very tragic. Yes. Karna's one of my most favorite characters from the Mahabharata. Used to be. Uh, and somebody, once I was having, a, I was on a podcast and somebody said, you know, I kind of think Karna was like, he did a lot of dumb stuff. And I said, you're not wrong. My problem with Karna was the same problem I had with myself. The authors don't redeem Karna, but Krishna tries to do so several times. I want to tell you, it is not just once. Krishna goes to Karna at least three, four, five times and begs him 
just join my side. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you your whole family history. You would be king of the world. I'll give you everything. Krishna is begging Karna. He's begging him to let him redeem him. Let me redeem you. I'll give you everything. Karna says, ah, I've got bigger duties. I'm sorry. It's the same problem I have with myself. Every day, Krishna comes to me and begs me, let me, let me redeem you. Let me take care of it. I'll give you everything. If you, if you surrender even for a moment, I'll give you everything. And I come with my list of things that are more important. I've got it under control. I've got my patients and my family and I've got this and I've got that. And sorry, you're just going to have to wait, Krishna. And every day, my Lord comes back and begs me again. An unlimited amount of times. So the authors might not redeem Karna, but Krishna tries to. He tries. And finally, when he can't try anymore, okay. Because he tries, but then we also make choices. So Karna's tragic story, I feel, is my own. The, the moral of that story is exactly the moral of my life. When will I finally say, okay, Krishna, I'll join your team. I will let you give me everything. And it, it sounds so petty when we say it like that, you know, like Krishna's begging us and like, I, you know what, Krishna, I can't let you give me everything. I have obligations that I have to handle on my own that I will come to you for later when they don't work out. And, and Krishna's asking us from the very beginning, before anything even happens, look, just, just be on my team and I'll make everything happen. I'll make it all occur, no problem. Yeah, I don't know. There's a section in Mahabharata, which my sister read to me recently, which kind of blew my mind. And it's a section where Krishna speaks about how, as Paramatma, he literally controlled everything from the beginning of Mahabharata to the end of Mahabharata so that everything would work out in the favor of the Pandavas. He literally sits and explains to them, I was present as Paramatma within the heart of Drona and asked him to ask Ekalavya for his thumb so that Arjuna, you would be the best. Say what? This is what Krishna does for his devotees. This is what he means in Bhagavad Gita when he says, I'm equal to everyone, but for my devotees, they get a special dispensation. From the beginning of our existence and even before, Krishna has been mapping things out for us to come to this point where we know him, recognize him, surrender to him, maybe, hopefully, possibly. Imagine that. And every time he approaches us, approaches us and says, okay, today, are we ready? We still somehow have the wherewithal to say no. My question is, if anyone were chronicling our story, would they be able to read us? Or would we be the tragic character? It's still up to us. Redemption, tragedy, all of that lies in one singular choice. Do we say yes to Krishna or not? That's it. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, it, I feel like this has been, it's like Bhagavatam class, also therapy, also Bhagavatam class. <laughs> thank you very much, Ashwini Gopi. It was, clearly was a therapy session for me. Thank you very much. Uh, all right.
Thank you, dear devotees, for contributing to this class so actively and sincerely. It's very inspiring. We love you all. We wish you a happy Ekadashi. Say yes to Krishna. Say yes to Krishna's devotees. Say yes to calamities. Say yes to miracles. Because it would be wonderful. You just put everything in perspective so nicely for us. Now we can fearlessly go through our day remembering Krishna and taking everything in the proper light. I like that. I like the I like the fearlessly part. Yeah, fearless. No fear. Srila Prabhupada was once asked, Srila Prabhupada, what do you feel when you chant your rounds? Srila Prabhupada says, I feel no fear. So let's feel no fear, dear yeah. devotees. I thought about that yesterday. It was just yesterday. I was thinking about Gopakumar and all of the mantras that we get. And Gopakumar and Brihad Bhagavatamrita, he gets a mantra from his guru and the guru says, this mantra will give you everything you desire and everything you have not even thought of desiring. This mantra will give you everything if you chant it with faith. And then Gopakumar does, and it gives him everything. And I thought to myself, am I chanting the Maha Mantra with the faith that this mantra will give me everything that I could possibly desire and everything I couldn't even think of desiring? Am I chanting with that faith? And then I chanted another round like, like, let me at least like, write it down and look at it as I chant and, and really remember this Maha Mantra can give me everything and anything that I've ever desired and more. On the strength of the words of our spiritual masters and on the strength of Srila Prabhupada and Krishna, this, this Maha Mantra can give us everything. And Srila Prabhupada has given us everything, so let's be generous as a Chittagopi. Told us, let's be generous and share it with others nicely, by our example, by our words and actions. Thank you very much. And good seeing you all, Kumar, good seeing you, Lila Manju, Dr. Hilo, Suzanne, Geshwari, Sharita, Geshwari, Amish, Rameshwar Naik, Wow, Rameshwar Naik, Angelika, Bal Devi, Atma Devi, and Saradevia. Love you all. Haribo. 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 Haribo.